Mr. Taru, in this video, we're going to do something that is unique. Well, kind of. We're going to do a lot of talk about math and the power of mathematics, but it is not a traditional high school uh, math lesson. Indeed, it, the reason why I'm doing this video is because I don't remember talking about this at all in high school, and the concepts that I'm going to talk about today is not part of any traditional high school curriculum that I'm aware of, at least not that we offer at our school. It's touched on here and there, but just, just a whisper, just a touch, and that is long-term compound interest. The power of it to benefit or to basically hurt or uh, your life. Basically, it's, it's a detriment or it's a benefit. And I talk about this with all of my classes every year, uh, except maybe the first year I was teaching high school, because, well, nobody in my family, as wonderful as my childhood was, as loving and supportive as my mother and parents were, uh, nobody talked about saving for retirement or handling money uh, when I was a child. And there's a little bit of finance thrown into high school curriculum, but very, very little of it. And I don't remember ever being uh, going through some kind of lesson in high school that dealt with the power of long-term compound interest. So, and money's a little bit of a touchy subject. I'm just trying to share without giving you know, too much information away a little bit of what I experienced in life and where I'm going through my planning of retirement. And just gonna drop a few pieces of information and a little bit of a seed to kind of maybe spawn you to um, uh, show some interest and in, in do some more research in this for yourself. So I grew up in a very good home, uh, very good neighborhood, nice home, three bedroom, two bath. You know, I was spoiled and um, I'm thankful that I was and I'm thankful for all the love that I was and can, can, uh, I'm continuing to be supported and loved by my mom. But when I was in late middle school, early high school age, so basically very late adolescent, early teenage years, my parents started to you know, have a lot of arguments and um, fighting, uh, ultimately leading to uh, divorce. And <clears throat> what started to kind of come out of all of that is, among other, other things, there was no support. See, money is a tool. Money is something that will give you security in life. It does not buy you happiness. No, it does not buy you health. But it does buy you security. And when the two income streams after the divorce separated and some bad financial decisions were made, you know, honestly, on both sides of uh, my parents' marriage, um, a l big mistake on my father's side because he, among other things, uh, uh, tried to invest in the stock market but by using margin, which means he was borrowing money to invest in stocks, which is a horrendous idea. So here I am living with my mom after the divorce in the home that is much too big with way too many bills and too much debt for her to handle and no savings to fall back on to, to speak of. So I got to watch my mom, unfortunately, not didn't get to watch her like it was a, a wonderful thing, but she worked multiple jobs constantly to try and pay bills and just keep us, if you want to call it afloat, keep us under that roof and uh, just kept the wheels rolling until we could finally, after a very long period of time, it was not a good uh, housing market back then, uh, to get out from underneath that house, to sell the house, and move on. But I saw how debt really kind of basically destroyed my mom's life to a degree, or at least made it kind of miserable for a really long time. So when I wanted to go, if I wanted to go to college, if I wanted to have some kind of, uh, you know, form of transportation that was mine, I was going to have to pay help pay for some of those bills. Not all of them, but, but help. My mom, God love her. I don't know how she did it. I don't know how many hours a week she worked. It felt like it was like 80 hours a week. But, um, you know, she did the best she could, and, and I'm beyond thankful uh, and for her uh, to this day and continue to love her. She's, she's awesome. But money 
it wasn't growing on trees. So I go out there, I get a job. It's, uh, it happened to be just a business that was not the closest business to my house. There's some restaurants and, and, and uh, grocery stores and, and whatnot. And I happened to go to a business that, unbeknownst to me, though I did hear it was a nice place to work and the, and the, pay, and the people seemed nice enough that they gave me a job, they started me on the journey of retirement, which is so weird because I'm like 16 years old and it's a part-time job and I'm going to school and um, I'm, I'm probably, probably pretty close to thinking I want to go into teaching. Um, and I have retirement, long-term compound interest is not even on my forefront, not even on my back front. I'm not thinking about it at all. I'm 17 years old and I get a check. But no, I don't get a check. I get two checks. And I'm like, okay, did you all make a mistake? I open one check up and it's my weekly salary. Well, you know, based on my hours worked, I forget what it was. But um, my second check is for like pennies, like three, four, eight cents. I don't remember, but it was enough, it was small enough that I was like, I remember this day, not the, not the amount, but like, this is stupid. Why waste the paper in the envelope to give me two checks when one is basically worthless? Well, it was a dividend check and that was the beginning. Now I didn't own the stock that this dividend came from. But what the company did for all their employees is once they started working there, that was their way of kind of uh, giving a benefit back to their employees was they started giving me stock. It was a uh, basically like a, what's it called, an ESOP program or basically like a profit sharing um, retirement system where they gave their employees back some stock. And once a year you would get uh, a bonus based on the hours you worked and such and such. And if you're part time and full time. Well, I ask to this day, even now with YouTube and all the great channels that talk about finance, CNBC, um, you know, maybe better curriculum in school, though I'm not sure if that's really the case. Um, all these avenues, all wonderful textbooks, uh, uh, I mean, uh, books that you can read um, about finance, uh, like The Millionaire Next Door uh, is one of them. I'm not sure that's the, anyway, um, I did enjoy the book. There's a lot more reading I need to do about this subject, but my personal experience was work hard, have pride in your work. When you get the money, you spend it. You know, that's how money comes in is working hard. And now I'm 17 and I get a dividend check worth of pennies. So let's get started. It's not all about the money. Money is not the root of all evil. Not money is not the, the you know, kind of like the thing that opens up the doors to forever happiness, but it does buy you security. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily buy you health, but it allows you to afford good food and good health care. Um, it can make your life um, as easy as possible. It can also make uh, a lack of it, make your life very difficult. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to discuss a a necessity for a lot of things, but sort of like the dark side of compound interest. Uh, we all need to borrow money. Like our first home, like we see here, power of compound interest, uh, mymortgageinsider.com. And in the middle of April, when I set up this PDF for my classes, um, it looked like the average, or that they stated that the average 30-year mortgage for a new home, uh, or just a home, was somewhere between 2.8 to 3.2%. Now, I'm nearly 50 years old, and I have never seen mortgage rates anywhere close to this low. This is historical times, um, good or bad. That's a uh, discussion beyond the scope of this video. Uh, a 15-year mortgage gives you an interest rate of obviously lower. Uh, we've got instead of 2.81, 2.2%, um, and, and you know they vary a little bit as the dates change through uh, April 8th to February 18th. And then you have a column for a 5-1 arm. I'm honestly not even sure what the 5-1 means. I believe it's, it's after either one or five years. Not really sure. But the ARM is adjusted rate, adjustable rate mortgage, which to me sounds like a terrible idea because if rates shoot up really high, your, 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 your mortgage may go up and you can't afford to live in the place that you otherwise could have. But point is, mortgages, let's say 3%. At valuepenguin.com, I found this wonderful little chart here that talks about the um, the average interest rate that it takes to buy a new car in the United States, again, mid-April. And uh, with all the 
ads you see, you sometimes see about you know zero percent financing for a new car. I was actually honestly shocked to see that for excellent credit, we'll talk about what that means. Um, an average new car loan interest rate is three point six percent, but that jumps up all the way to fifteen point two four percent. So basically three and a half to up to over fifteen percent interest rate. That's quite the gap. And a big difference in the cost of buying a new car. And the reason why these numbers are so different is because it is about your FICO score. Now, when I do this money talk with my own personal students, hardly anybody has ever known what a dividend is. And believe me, there is a lot about finance I do not understand. I'm just going to talk about mainly talking about investing in mutual funds, index funds, or individual stocks, basically the stock market of some format, because it's what I know. And even that's maybe sketchy. Um, but people that loan money will give you a report card based on how consistent and how reliably you pay your bills, just like I give my students report cards based on the quality uh, uh, of their work and their test scores. And your reliability of paying your loans back are going to greatly affect how much you pay for things or even where you can live. Uh, when you go to rent a place, um, even not even buying, the, the person that you're going to rent from is going to want to know your credit history to help determine whether you can you know, pay your rent. So, okay, so NerdWallet here says that credit scores go somewhere between 300 to 850 from bad, fair, good, and excellent credit. Now, if you're looking at this video and you're younger, like most of my uh, viewers on YouTube are, because I make all of my math videos for Edge for School, you're not going to have any, now I'm, I'm circling bad and fair, but you're not going to even have a credit history to determine your credit score. So when you go to initially start looking for, for credit or to borrow money, you're a high risk uh, borrower. And the, the institution that is going to give you money on a loan is going to charge you more in interest because they are not quite sure if they're going to get their money back. So what goes into um, this credit score? It's just a brief overview. And how do we go from the no credit history to good or excellent credit score as quickly as possible? Well, you want to pay your bills on time. You want to pay your rent, your um, utilities, your cell phone, your credit card bill if you have one. How much do you owe? Do you owe a lot for your income? Um, how much do you owe in relation to how much available credit you have? How old are you? What's your mix of credit? Is it all a bunch of credit cards? Is it a car loan and a mortgage and a credit card? The, the types of loans and the mixture of those. And you can read this article on nerdwallet.com. I'll put the link in the description below uh, that you can go to kind of read this more in depth. Basically, the more reliable you are in paying your bills, the, the longer you uh, credit history you have, the higher that number goes up, and really the less expensive it is going to cost for you to um, borrow money or even live in the form of maybe finding a place to rent. We all know these little plastic cards that we put in our wallet allow us to buy things. But when you use one of these credit cards, you're not buying something with your cash. You're buying something on loan. Okay, so money is always moving and being used in different ways. If we work, we create value and our employers pay us that value in the terms of dollars. That's one way of making money. Banks and institutions, uh, money institutions, they make money by giving us money. But then they say, hey, you have to pay us back at maybe a 3% or a 3 to 15% uh, interest rate. And that's exactly what these cards are. Now, if you want to 
you know, get a plane ticket, rent a car. There's a lot of things that you cannot do in life, or at least seemingly, I could be technically wrong there, uh, but you basically can't do or easily do without a credit card, without this piece of plastic, which understand is a loan in your pocket. Now, the great thing about one of these credit cards is if someone steals your wallet or somehow gets the information off of it and, and fraudulently makes some charges, you're not going to be held liable. That credit card company, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, uh, Discovery, whatever, um, they're going to take your claim, your fraud claim, uh, make sure that it's valid, and if so, they're not going to hold you liable for any of those purchases. They'll send you a new card and all, so on and so on. If someone steals your wallet, call it in. My wallet was stolen. I lost my card, whatever. Um, they issue a new one. If you lose your wallet with 100 bucks and a $100 bill in it, and that $100 bill is lost, then that $100 is gone. So this is fraud protection. There is a benefit of using these cards. Plus, of course, it's convenient, yada, yada, yada. But there is one and one reason only that you are offered one of these credit cards. It is one of the best ways for other people to make money off of you. Now, when you use these credit cards, if you buy something and you go, I've got $100 in the bank and I'm going to buy something for 30 bucks. And if you know at the end of the month, you can write a check for that full $30, then you have a 0% interest rate. Anything that you pay off within a month is basically, in, in terms of your usage of the card, free. Now, the merchant, the store, has to pay a fee to, uh, let's say, Visa, American Express, or all this. I mean, they're all basically the same. You know, if you use a Visa card, whoever you bought something from, like the grocery store or gas station, they have to pay a certain small fee, like, I don't know if it's 2% or something, but they, they pay a small fee to Visa to allow you and allow them to use this card. But on your end, you'll be like, I bought $30 worth of something at the end of the month, I paid $30, I sent the $30 back, we're good, it's even Steven. But as soon as you roll over the 30 days, um, basically, they start charging you interest. Now, with the idea that mortgages were 3% basically and car loans were somewhere between three and a half to 15 is pretty extreme, we'll call it like even 6%. Uh, for a new car loan. And what do you think it is on a credit card? Well, normally I'm used to asking that, class, that question when I'm in class with my students. If you have excellent credit, such as we see here from creditcards.com, Bank of America is going to charge you anywhere from 14 to 24 percent a year. So let's stick that in the middle, sort of ish, and say 20%. So if you buy $100 worth of something, basically by the end of the year, you're going to have to owe payback, well, about $120 instead of $100. Now, if you buy $100 and you pay it off at the end of the month and you send a $100 check in, that's it. 0% interest. You bought $100, you pay $100, that's it. But as soon as you roll over and they start charging you interest, it is a high interest. Now, if you have um, in Capital One, 16 to 25%, when I built, when I built up this, seat with the, this PDF, uh, American Express, 14 to 24%, so they're all kind of within the same range. If you have average or fair credit, again, according to creditcards.com, April 1st, 2021, Fair or average, not even like poor, horrible credit. Um, here we go, Capital One Platinum credit card, 27%. Now notice the difference here. It is 27%, not 14 to 24%. So for every $100 you borrow and don't pay back at the end of the month, you're going to owe $127 back at the end of the year. So you just basically threw away $27 that you paid and got nothing in return other than the ability to buy something that you didn't have the cash for. Now, how do you pay back these credit cards? This is the very negative, the bad side, if you will, of compound interest. How do you pay a credit card back? A very few percentage of Americans... Um, in our credit-based society where we like to spend everything we make, if not more, 
uh, will, will pay a credit card off every single month. Now, here at the balance.com, again, link in the description, we have methods of paying back credit cards. And you can do a percent of the balance plus a finance charge. You can do a percentage of the balance or other variations because basically um, there's very little, if any, I'm not, again, positive on that. Uh, you can do some more research on your own, but there is very little, if any, regulation from the government um, determining how you pay back credit card debt. And trust me, at 25% interest or 20% interest or even 27% interest, the credit card companies do not want you to pay off your credit card because they're making money off of you. So we're going to work at the end of this about you making money for yourself and not necessarily by just working. Um, so that being said, understanding that there's a multitude of ways that credit cards can be paid back on the minimum balance, we're going to focus on that the, the common way of um, calculating a payment at the end of the month, and again, this is on time, we're going to do a 4% balance of the loan as your minimum payment. So not as bad as two and not as high as five. Let's see if this works. Okay, so here we have at greenpath.com's uh, minimum credit card payment or minimum payment credit card calculator. And we're not going to make this, I'm not going to try and exaggerate these numbers. I don't need to. We're going to have a credit card balance of $10,000. So pretty big balance. You've maybe um, got close to the maximum uh, limit of your credit card. And your interest rate is 21%. So, and I just wanted a nice round number. So not as low as it could be, but not as high as it could be with, with fair credit of like, what I say, 26, 27%, and a minimum payment of 4%. Now you saw that it could be as low as 2%. How long do you think it's going to take to pay off this $10,000 loan, assuming that you never use your, cal your um, credit card again? It's going to take you... 177 months, and you're going to pay back a total of $17,600. That is well over 10 years to pay off your credit card debt by only making minimum payments at the end of every month, and they're going to make $7,600 off of you for that $10,000 loan I don't know, whatever, this was about 14 years ago or something like that. So, and you're never going to touch your credit card for 14 years or whatever that is. Now it's bothering me. What is that? Yes, 14 years and basically about eight months. Wow, that sucks. Okay, so if you get caught in a vortex, a spiral of debt with credit cards, you're going to have a very hard time ever getting ahead, much less or even making ends meet. And that is why you get so many credit card offers in the mail or when you, if you're in high school, the first thing you're going to get when you're at the finance office and discussing student loans and how you're going to pay for college, they're, <laughs> hey, you want a, you know, UF uh, credit card? You want, uh, you know, whatever, go Bulls, get this credit card? Um, they're going to offer you that college branded credit card because they want to make money off of you. It has nothing to do with, you know, school spirit. So credit cards are a necessity. Credit cards are a security. If they get stolen, you're not held liable. Or if you're, uh, your, your information is stolen, there's fraud protection. But it is a dangerous, dangerous tool. That's why, uh, that's the dark side, basically, of your um, long-term compound interest. So let's flip the script and start looking at the positive side. So the positive side, oh, before I get to that, snapshot of consumer debt via bankrate.com. Uh, in the average debt in the U.S. in 2020, average credit card debt, 
So was I exaggerating that previous screen where I used a $10,000 limit um, or value on a credit card? Well, personal loans are $16,000. Now, a personal loan could be something that you took out to, I don't know, do a little bit of remodeling on your house. Um, but one of the common personal loans is a, con uh, a consolidation loan where you take all of your uh, <clears throat> high interest loans and group them together into a single loan that you hope has a lower interest rate and thus makes it easier to pay down your debt. So you have $21,000 of average U.S. the one U.S. individual. The average debt held in 2020 is about 21, almost $22,000. That's not considering a car loan. That's not uh, considering college or student loan debt. I have no idea what H-E-L-O-C stands for. I'm sorry. And it also doesn't include your mortgage, which apparently American, the average uh, mortgage in the United States in 2020 was $208,000. That is a lot of average debt to be held by the, you know, sort of whatever, adult in the United States. Probably not adult like a 20-year-old, but maybe some, anyone that owns a home. So that is a lot of debt. That's a lot of money going to banks and uh, financial institutions that are just simply giving you money to use before maybe you could actually afford the things that you own. Now, again, we can't buy homes and a lot of us can't buy um, a car with cash, but maybe you buy an older car uh, that, you don't need, that you don't have to have a loan or that it's a smaller loan than $20,000. Uh, okay, so this took a little bit of looking, but on money.com, <laughs> if you're still sticking with me, you're awesome. Thank you very much. Um, money.com retirement. And this uh, graphic shows here that boomers and seniors, and this, I think this was back in 2016, yes. Um, boomers and seniors, age 55, around 55 years or older. 28, 38, 45. So about 45% based on this data, however they collected it, I'm not really sure. Um, but of the survey of this data they collected, however it is they managed to do that, about 45% of seniors were saying that they were going to into retirement with either no retirement savings or less than $10,000. You better have some sources of income if you plan on living you know, from 55, 60 to maybe 90 or even 80 for that matter, 25, 30, 35 years with no income coming in because $10,000 divided by 25 is not very much money per year. And then on the high side of the at least having 200000 if not over $300,000, those two percentages, actually, let's go down to $100,000. $100,000 or more for uh, retirement savings, that comes out to be, what, 22, 32, um, 38, we'll call it basically close to 40%. So 45% going into retirement or near retirement with basically no savings for retirement and then you have about 40% that are going into retirement with a, a reasonable amount, if not a lot, of money. And you see these numbers in the middle are very low. Why? Now, again, I don't know what hardships I will face in life or that you will face in life. Um, but I'm going to simplify this and um, take it at, as you will. But I think it's no planning and planning. Yes, things happen that you can't control and they put you into circumstances financially that you were not um, expecting. But a lot of this just boils down to, I thought about money or someone helped me um, think about money early on and um, I planned or that did not happen and I did not. So how do you get rich? Do you make a ton of money? Do you win the lottery? Do you need to be like some star football player? Well. By Washington Post, in this um, story that I found, according to the National Endowment of Financial Education, about 70% of people who win a lottery or receive a large windfall go bankrupt within just a few years. What? You mean so being wealthy and comfortable in retirement or at any point in your life isn't all about what you make or what comes in? Why athletes go broke? 
wonderful documentary from ESPN about um, the financial um, journey of, of, of major athletes, high paid athletes after retirement. And I think there's so much out there now about um, financial responsibility that maybe the numbers are hopefully getting better. But um, according to Sports Illustrated, 78% of NFL players who retired for only two years file for bankruptcy. And after five years of retirement, 60% of NFL, NBA players suffer the same fate. Now, I'm not sure why, honestly, these numbers are so high. And then down here in pink, it says something about 16% of NFL players um, drafted in a particular year also file for bankruptcy. But my point here is money is a tool and it needs to be respected. And really all you need to be financially healthy and um, secure is to do one thing. Well, start with one thing. Spend less than you make, whatever it is you make. If you don't make very much, I mean, like my wife and I love going thrifting and cutting coupons. Um, and we also enjoy life too, but you can control how much money leaves you. And you actually, and to some degree, you can control how much money comes in. But once the money is moving, just simply hold on to more than you let go. And at some point, you're going to be financially secured. And you will not get rich. You will not get wealthy by simply working hard only. If you have to work for every dollar that comes in to your financial account, you can build up savings, but you're never going to be independent, you know, uh, monetarily independent or secure or, you know, call it wealthy, whatever that may mean to you. You need multiple streams of income. Like right now, I didn't, I made, I started my YouTube channel to help people with math. And after I made enough videos, I started realizing that a little bit of money was trickling in. And, and, and it's still kind of just a little bit, but it's a fairly, it's a, it's a meaningful amount of money. I couldn't live off of it for sure. Uh, but I'm very thankful for the dollars that come in now every month from my many years of building my YouTube channel. And then what I do with that money is, you know, some months I buy something I like, or maybe a new phone or some camera equipment. Um, I also put a lot of that money to work um, in mutual funds, index funds, and um, just in general stocks. I try and put my money somewhere that will then start to make me money. This, I work for income. I get money from YouTube as a side hustle. And remember the dividend I got as a 17 year old? I still get dividends from that company that I worked for. And I knew so little about money. I had so little financial literacy and I was so terrified of debt that when I retired, if you want to call it that, uh, from that company, I technically did. When I retired from that company, uh, after working there for nine years and them giving me all of that profit, that, that profit sharing that they did for the first, well, for all nine years. And then at some point buying some myself, I almost sold that investment to buy my first car because I was terrified of getting that loan and having that debt and having it, you know, basically just push down on weigh on me like it did with my mother, um, especially after the divorce when she was trying to keep the roof over our head. And thankfully I was talked out of that because um, that company is still paying me every year. And the amount that that company is paying me every year in dividends is now equal to, if not more, some of those first years that I was working. I'm getting money today that each year is about the same, if not a little bit more than those first few years that I actually worked for. I have money coming in that I'm not, not working for. I just simply had to put my money to work. So how do you become financially independent? Spend less than you make, make a budget, stick with it. Put money to work. Now you can put money in the bank and you should have three to six months of uh, cash, if not maybe a little bit more in an account. So when things happen, like something health wise, um, you get sick or your partner gets sick or maybe divorce, 
or like a couple of years ago when um, my wife and I, we had to put a new roof on our house. I mean, that, nowadays, getting, just getting shingles on a roof that's actually in good shape is like an eight to $10,000 prospect. Have the cash on hand so when you get that big bill in, you can pay it without being reliant on, oh man, I can't, ooh, I gotta get a loan. You know, I gotta get a seven, eight, 10, 15% interest personal loan, or maybe, God forbid, put it on my credit card and pay 25% interest for a roof that I need to keep water from coming in into my home. Um, find a side hustle like, you know, Tudor, um, YouTube. Maybe it's just a, simply a second job. Mowing, uh, you know, taking care of people's yards, mowing the yards of your, some of your neighbors um, when you're not uh, at your regular job. Um, and then buy assets that will potentially make money, like stocks, which is mainly what I want to talk about. I don't know anything about bonds other than it's a secured loan basically generally to the government. And right now the interest rates are quite low. Or rental property, which I don't want to be the person that has to go to someone after they haven't paid rent and basically kick them out of their home. You know, I don't like dealing with people in that way. So I am not someone that is ever going to have rental property because I just don't, I would never feel comfortable in that situation. Um, but make it so that you're making money while you sleep. Okay, so the United States average savings rate in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, the national savings rate was between 10 and 15%. Um, we had a slow decline in the national savings rate until I had, I've lost the, the paper now, but at some point around 2005, I had an article that said the national savings rate had actually momentarily dipped below zero. Like the whole nation on average was spending more than they were making. And then what happened after 2008, uh, 2005? In 2008, we had the house bubble burst and we had the Great Recession, which was almost um, a full-blown depression. And ever since then, ever since 2008, um, the government has been doing everything possible to kind of rebuild the economy, boost the stock market, boost people's... Um, um, Anyway, just support the, the monetary system, and for good or bad, it's definitely, for, I think, in general, a good, but now there's a lot of talk about artificially inflating the economy. I mean, considering that we've, we've basically printed about $6 trillion in the last year for COVID relief, I mean, why do you think this national savings rate has spiked to be like nearly 35% recently? It's not because we're all of a sudden like, oh, I get, uh, you know, I want to be financially responsible. No, it's because we're, we've been COVID lockdown, not be able to go anywhere do anything, and then the government's like, oh, well, we're afraid that you might be kicked out of your home, and a lot of people, you know, I mean, like, I can't even imagine being a service, you know, like a service industry, um, having a lot of debt, having a lot of bills, and not having any money come in. I know a lot of people are really, really suffering. Um, but trillions of dollars have been printed with no real, like, wealth creation behind it. The government just hit the button and printed a bunch of dollar bills. Well, what do you think is going to happen with all the money that you already have? If, if, if you just have a piece of paper that says, you know, one on it, a $1 bill, and now there's six trillion more $1 bills floating around, what's the value of that dollar bill that you have? I mean, I think inflation is going to spike. And I think that, uh, you know, we're going to kind of have a, a little bit of, I think the, I think the, the stock market is probably going to drop here for a while. Um, I mean, we've printed a lot of money and have a lot of debt. Um, and the, that's what the markets do is they go up and down. Now, getting close to the stock market, okay, there's this thing called a CD, which you may not know what that is. But a CD is not the little sort of plastic disc that we put music on. It is at least, well, it can be, but I'm thinking of a certificate of deposit where you give the bank your money, it's FDIC insured, basically insured by the government, and you're giving the, the bank your money and you're saying, okay, I'm not giving you this money and I might possibly ask for it back tomorrow. I'm giving you this money and I'm not going to ask for it back just for six months or a year or even five years. And by giving the bank your money and saying that you're not going to ask for your money back for five years, it gives the bank a lot more flexibility in what they're going to do with your money. And they, they know that you're not going to ask for it back right away, which means that maybe they have more freedom in the type of loans, say, 
that they give other people that they'll expect back because they're going to make money on the money that you put in the bank. And I remember when interest rates on CDs were like, you know, four, five, six percent. And when the interest rates right now are like nearly zero, you're like, man, I remember when banks, man, you know, you could actually make money on your money. But the one thing that my friends always forget when they talk about, you know, the good old days when you could actually make some real interest on your CD is when you have your money in a basically a guaranteed account where you're arguably guaranteed to not be able to lose any money, you're not going to have, that's not much risk and thus you won't make much gain. And when you look at the years where CDs were paying between four and 6% and you compare it to the CPI or the basically the inflation rate um, and there's, and you go back and you look at, well, this is 84 to, to, to 20, 20, so maybe this is around the 2000s. If you go back there and you look at maybe like those 90s, those mid 90s, and you look at that inflation, that inflation is around what? It's around maybe three, four, five, or over inflation rate. So your four to three to four to five to six percent CDs were really just basically sort of approximating the inflation rate of that time. Or, man, look at here, back in like, okay, so this is going to be easy. This graph starts around 1984. Well, in 84, CDs were paying like between 9 and 11, almost 12% back in 84. Somewhere around in here, inflation rate was 5, but just before that, the inflation rate was 10%. So, CDs may be slightly above and will likely be slightly below the actual inflation rate. So your money in a CD, you're not maybe necessarily losing any money, but you're just matching, if not losing a little bit to inflation. What the heck is inflation? Inflation is $100 today is not going to buy $100 of value next year. Our national, saving, our national interest rate, the average interest rate is about 3%. So $100 today will only buy, if you still have the $100, effectively $97 in a year. The value of a dollar is always going down, and especially considering how many trillions of dollars we've printed in the last year. Um, I can't fathom how that would not lower the value of each of our dollars that are not invested, each of our dollars that are sitting in a bank. So what do you get if you invest in the stock market? Well. Here's a chart from the fools.com or Motley Fool, not Motley, but fool.com. Um, and it shows the return. And these are actually higher than I expected, so I'm not quite sure why. But um, the S&P 500 is an index that tracks the largest 500 companies in the United States. And collectively, those 500 largest mature companies, your Home Depot, your Microsoft, your IBM, your Apple, um, whatever, uh, the biggest companies, anything you could think of um, that comes to mind and you're like, oh yeah, I've heard of that company. Those 500 largest companies over a 10, 30, and 50 year track record, and I would not put much faith in the last 10 years as much as the uh, government has done to sort of boost, if not artificially boost the market, 14% interest. But if you track that over 30 or 50 years, 11% annual for every one year your average return was 11%. Now, I still think that's high because you don't hear that normally. But So if you back it up to 1957, uh, the S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in the U.S., have returned an average of 8% a year. Now, after inflation, and you see you can take away a little over 2%. You can take away actually 4% here. Now this chart is giving you kind of like the real inflation like, or the, the, the real sort of gain on your investments after you account for the fact that each dollar is going to buy less and less over time, that 11% is really like a 7% real return or the 10.7% effectively in your buying power is about an 8% return a year and so on and so on. So that's, again, as I'm 17 and I get my first dividend check, what's happening is, is that company 
is give me little fractional shares that I wasn't even basically legally able to own, but it wasn't me buying them. It was the company putting it into an account that I would be vested in uh, within five after five years, meaning what they gave me was, was, was going to be mine. That started the ball rolling when I was 16 years old of my little nest egg, and it was just a little piece of sand or dust just starting to roll and pick up as it went on. Now, we'll get to this calculator here in a second. Um, let's break off to, hopefully you're finding this interesting. So here at macrotrends.net, the actual link, again, I'll have on the description below, um, gives you all kinds of charts, whoops, gives you all kinds of charts to play with. Um, Dow Jones by year, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and um, performance by president, and so on and so on and so on, the 1929 bear market. I want to focus on, let's say, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I worked for a company for nine years, then I started teaching, and about a year or two later I started thinking about, again, saving for retirement, and it's around 1999. And whether it was the right choice or not, I think ultimately it probably was. Um, Warren Buffett would say not. And um, we hired a financial advisor to help us in 1999. Well, in 1999, there was a 25% return on the stock market. And then basically when we started, there was a negative 6% and a negative 7%, and a negative nearly 17%. If you look at the NASDAQ, which is, stop doing that, when you look at, a, when you look at the NASDAQ, and, which is a collection of four, basically more like technology-oriented companies, um, when we started with our financial advisor, we had a great, and we didn't start in all of 1999, but 99 was a good year, and then in 2000, a loss of 39%. In 2001, 21%. 2002, that, this is the dot-com bubble. Negative 31%. You add up those percentages, that is a humongous loss. So here I am, we just hired this financial advisor. Uh, she's got her money in a multitude of different areas, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, a little bit of gold, I mean, you know, whatever. But we gave her money for three years in a row. And in the end of the three years, we had less in our account than we started with. <gasps> this is such a dumb idea. Why did I do this? And if it hadn't been that, for that company that I worked for as a child, up through high school and college, I would have thought the same thing and just been like, oh, this is stupid. I'll just put money in the bank. I'm really glad I did not do that. Um, because... Should we really be shocked or worried um, when we put our money into large, good, strong corporations and they lose some value because of fear? Um, every time I buy a car, by the time I sell it, it's worth nothing. I'll, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 000, $35,000 in a car. You go to sell that car eight, nine years later, you're not getting any money for it, but yet we don't. Yet we don't blink an eye at buying some real, you know, some nice car and knowing that it's going to lose tens of, not many tens of thousands of dollars before we sell it. Yet you buy a good company and it loses 30% and you're going to freak out and sell it. No, if you buy a good company and all of a sudden it's 30, 40% cheaper, how about you go, hey, this is a company run by smart, intelligent, hardworking people with a lot of people underneath them all working towards the same goal of, of you know, growing that company and being successful, and I'm not going to put more money behind that. No, there might be good and there bad investments, but no. If you've put your money in the stock market and you have it in mutual funds and indexes, your chance of coming ahead, coming out ahead in the long run is much, much greater than coming out behind. So I started 
working around somewhere just before 1990. And you can see that the orange line is the NASDAQ, the blue line is the S&P 500, and when we have a big drop there in 2000, um, yeah, it hurt, but it was still above where it would be if it was just in the bank. So, so whether the stock market goes down as much as 53% as it did during the Great Recession or shortly after bounce back up to 65 or 70% or around 40% like it did around a little bit after 1950 or 1970 or all these really good years just before the dot-com um, bust uh, or down 38% in 2008 when we had the housing collapse. It goes up and it goes down, but in the long run, that long-term trend is up. And yeah, you might buy high and have that stock go down, but if those are good companies and you believe in your investments, or if it's just an, a basket of the largest 500 companies in the United States, just keep buying as it goes down and lower your cost of those good companies so that you don't have to wait, you know, a whole, like whatever that is, 10, 15, 20 years um, for the stock market to kind of catch back up. And the one thing that this graph does not um, reflect are those returns on your uh, dividends. So what I want to do right now is take a look at this little story that somebody posted on Reddit. Yes, you're getting financial advice from a stranger on YouTube that is now citing something on Reddit. But this user, and there are different results for different time periods. I'm just picking 40 years because it's a pretty long term, like for me going from 20 to 60. And gathering all of the data from the S&P 500, the returns for that, we've got a scenario and it's a buy and hold. So These is gonna be the story of three people saving $200 of their income a month. So what is that? 2,400 a year. And they do that for 40 years for a total of $96,000. Now, Tiffany only buys at the high. And I'll put a link to this um, Reddit page uh, in the description below. But she bought and hold at the worst timing during these 40 years. And after 40 years, she still managed to have buying at the worst time. You buy in next day, pff, collapse. Buy, collapse. Did that a certain number of times. The story's in here. When she uh, did not have her money in the stock market, it was getting 3% interest in the bank, which I'm sure the author of this picked because it's close to the national average rates of inflation. But your, her $96,000 turned into $663,000, let's ignore the discussion of taxes, um, after 40 years. Brittany had perfect timing. Again, both all of this is buy and hold, for 40 years, never selling, kept her money in the bank, only put money to work in the stock market when it was at its absolute bottom and somehow magically knew over 40 years what those perfect bottoms were. And after 40 years, money in the bank getting 3% interest when it wasn't going to work in the stock market had a total of $956,000. That is pretty considerably better than the 663,000, but it's like only 300,000 more, or 50% more, which kind of seems like a big percentage difference, for having that perfect timing. And I've seen this also done for 30 years, and the, and the outcomes are actually closer, to be honest, um, and are ultimately a little bit different. Now, slow and steady, uh, slow and steady Sarah. We think about, think about a, uh, Putting, she's putting money to work basically every paycheck, or maybe it's every month, I'm, I forget, but like a 401 or 403B contribution or an IRA contribution that is sponsored by a place that you work or you're just very disciplined and you're doing this um, on your own where you're putting money into the stock market in the form of a mutual fund ETF or individual stocks. Um, I, would, I would lean towards the boring side and just do ETFs, but you're just putting money to work whenever. And she never looks at her account. She never takes money out. She has no idea what's going on in the news. And I just gave away the answer, but whether it's high, whether it's low, just every couple of weeks or every month, 
$200 goes into the stock market, and just $200. I'm sure she's making more than that, that she's enjoying life, going to concerts, enjoying buying nice clothes, paying bills. Um, at the end of 40 years, her nest egg is actually the highest of all of them. So it's not about perfect timing in the market. It's about how long you're in the market, how long you've been investing. And you're not being forced to sell your investments because you're borrowing money to invest it and then your margins get called and you have to be, you have, you're forced to sell stuff when it's down. Um, how do you invest in the stock market? Well, if you um, want to do something outside of work or if you have your, if your own, if you're like you're an entrepreneur and you're doing your own thing, um, you can do a traditional IRA where you pay the taxes um, later. You put your money in before tax. The good thing about that is you're getting more money to work early. The negative about a traditional IRA or a traditional 401k plan or 403b plan is that you pay taxes after you get out. So if you make $10,000, well, look at it. You make $1,000, let's say for investment, you get to invest $1,000. But at the end, if when you take the money out, whatever money is above that amount that you invested will be taxed as income. Whereas anything with a Roth, a Roth IRA or a Roth 403B or 401k, that is where you pay your tax up front, but then it grows. And when you take it out, it's gro it grows and what you take out is not taxed. So this, a traditional IRA or 401k is you're, you get to invest the money pre-tax. So you don't pay the tax on the money you put in, but you do pay it up when you get out. A Roth IRA or a Roth 401k plan is you pay the tax first. The, the, the bad thing is you'll have a slightly smaller amount that you're going to initially invest, but as that investment grows over decades, when you take the money out, uh, as, they're been, have, as they've been designed uh, with the laws, you don't pay the income tax as you take the money out. So if you put 10,000 in, that you've paid tax on at the end, it's a hundred thousand. You don't pay tax on the ninety thousand dollars worth of profit like you would with a traditional IRA or four hundred one k. And again, look it up, Forbes.com, and, and you can find other again ideas like this. If you uh, and more information to invest uh, and study on your own. Best employee sponsor retirement plans, uh, a traditional 401k or a 403b, very, very similar. This is for like nonprofits, but it's basically a 403b is basically the same as a traditional uh, 401k plan. Um, I finally, after 20, nearly 25 years of teaching, I've turned mine off because I'm pretty sure that taxes are going to go up um, in the couple of decades before I'm going to need to take that money out. And I'm switching over to uh, basically a Roth IRA where I want to pay my tax now and not later. And when you get this money invested, wherever or however you put it, you can Google this. This is exactly what I did, the best trading platforms in 2020. Um, and based on stockbrokers.com, uh, uh, they listed TD Ameritrade, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, Interactive Brokers, or E-Trade. And then once you open up an account that takes almost no time at all, you start investing it. Now, by the way, for investing, okay, interest calculator, calculator.net. So here we're going to put in a value of zero. So we're going to start off with zero dollars to begin with. And we're going to put in $5,000 a year. Now, if that's too high, make it smaller. Make it $2,000. Make it $1,000. Make it $100 a year. Make it anything that you feel like you can handle. And we're going to put in a 10% interest rate. Now, that's just to kind of make it a little bit high enough so the numbers are fun. And, but not crazy high. Like the S&P 500, it's about, what we say, about 8% for, from 57 to 2020. But for the last uh, 50 years... From 1970 to 2020, the S&P returned an average of almost 11%. So 10 is reasonable, long-term, hopefully. What you're seeing in this chart is 
a green line, which is your final balance, a blue line, which is the money out of your pocket, and the black line, which is interest. So if you make an investment of um, 2000 a year for five years, at the end of that five years, the blue line, the money out of your pocket, is closer to the green line, the total. So most of that money after five years came out of your pocket. Well, if you back that up to 10 years, we can see that near at the end of 10 years, the green total line is around $35,000. There's a chart below this. Um, and the interest, let's call it $15,000. But after, tw after 10 years, the majority of your $35,000 that you have is still money that came out of your pocket. Okay, if I, back that th if I back this up to 45 years, assuming that you start saving for retirement when you're 20 and you stop at 65, which is sort of like basically kind of like an average um, uh, age to retire, The black line at the end of 45 years, look at the black line of that over $1.5 million, about $1.5 million is interest, not money out of your pocket. After 45 years, you have an end result of $1.6 million. Yes, if you invest $2,000 a year for 45 years, you're going to have one point, almost $1.6 million. Now with inflation, effectively in today's dollars, that's really only like $418,000. That's still a huge chunk of change and puts you well above the average American for um, your planning of retirement. And by the way, that one point nearly $6 million only cost you out of your pocket $90,000, which is a lot of money, but we're talking about money out of your pocket for 45 years. And I'll take that. Okay. That's what my initial company that I worked for did for me. They started this little ball rolling to allow me to have security that I otherwise would not have financial security that I ever otherwise would not have at this point in my life or will have by the time I retire. And another thing I want to point out to you, just play with these numbers, put in any number that you feel you could manage. Um, and of course, in real life, you can adjust how much you deposit for retirement anytime you want. But check this out. If we look at this graph and think about the power of compound interest, this is um, 5,000 a year at 11% interest a year for 45 years. Whatever the interest is, okay, I want you to look at this. Two and a half million dollars, it takes you, starting from zero, about 37 years to attain that first two and a half million dollars. And if you start when you're 20, then right now you're about 57. Oh man, that's so old. Well, hopefully you're still quite healthy and, and, and full of life at that age. But check this out, 37 years to get to your first two and a half million dollars under this scenario. You're going to get another two and a half million dollars in, let's call it from 37 to 44. So seven years to accumulate another two and a half million dollars. That's because it's the money doing the work, not you. And with this story, over 45 years of savings, you have five and a half million dollars in today's buying power, which is only $1.5 million at darn inflation. But by only taking out $225,000 of your own money, and you want to find something really interesting, do it on your own. Do on calculator.net, some kind of calculation like this, get to a total number and then pretend like you're going to save for say 15 years and you're not gonna start saving for retirement at 65 until you're 50. And look at how big that number needs to be. I guess I could just make the video even longer and do that for you. So here we got $4 million at 10% interest, $4 million, okay. 
Let's say we want to get this $4 million that cost us two hundred and twenty. I can't play with my laser pointer now. $225,000 out of our pocket to get $4 million, let's call it. But that's with 45 years of saving. Let's say that we want to do this in 20 years. Is it going to take 15000 a year? Not even close. That's only a total of $1 million almost. I'm rounding up, obviously. Let's say $30,000. Nope. We're still half. Still 20 years. Still 10% interest. $1.9 million, not $4 million. This is probably going to be over. Not even over yet. Wait a minute. If I don't start saving until I'm 45 at the same 10% interest rate, I have to save 60000 a year, put in $1.2 million, and I'm still not going to have that same amount that I had if I started when I was 20 and only put a little over $200,000 in over my entire basically 45 years of that particular life. How many people do you know can invest $60,000 a year when we were doing, I don't know, whatever that number was? What was it? $5,000 a year? $5,000 a year and ended up with, no. Yes, because it was 45 years. $5,000 a year for 45 years is a heck of a lot easier than $60,000 a year for 20 and still not and, and still at this current scenario you see on your screen, this is still more money. Compound interest, baby. It's where it's at. So you go get your brokerage account set up or get your 401k started. And yes, I would be shocked if we do not have some pretty negative economic situation happen here in the next couple of years with all the money that we've printed. But just like when I started investing back in 2000 and in 2001 and in 2002, that market kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And I'm telling you, it sucked. But now, all of my dividends total that I've earned from that first job I got when I was 16 and did not sell those shares to get my first car, those dividends all accumulated, added up as a whole, are worth more than I make in a year. Now granted, it took a long time for that to build up, but still, think about that. If I teach for a year, I will, the, the, the value that I'll gain from this is going to be less than what that company has and still continues to pay me in dividends accumulated over, you know, a little over 40 years, right? No, I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, 30 years. Um, my side hustle of YouTube, as much work as it's been, and the amount of money I get from YouTube now is not really honestly that much a year. But if I accumulated over the last 11 years or 10, 10 11 years I've been doing YouTube, it also cumulatively is worth more than I make in one year of teaching. Um, and once you get an account open, say like at Fidelity, where you can easily open up a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or just simply a brokerage account, and you start, if you want some ideas, just Google it. Google, you know, top ETF, exchange traded fund. They're practically free to purchase. They're the number one stock recommendation from Warren Buffett and, um, oh my gosh, I just lost his name, the founder of Vanguard. Um, he basically built his business off of practically free, super low cost um, investing tools. You can do um, mutual funds and pay someone that is going to um, hopefully beat the returns that you can get from an ETF, like a like an SPY or an IVV, just a standard S&P 500 index fund. Um, but the vast majority of money managers don't actually beat the returns of the largest 500 companies in the United States. But 
if you want to look that up. And I have one in my um, basket of investments that I hope continue to do this. But you can search mutual funds that have beat the S&P 500 and look for a long period of time and then pull one of those out. Um, boom, 25 best mutual funds of all time. Now I'll go scroll through that story at Kipling, uh, kiplinger.com and get some ideas. Um, and then once you have an idea, um, this is one of the funds I own, the Fidelity Blue Chip Growth Fund that has historically beat the S&P 500. You can look and see a report card that they got from Morningstar um, that talks about their investments, uh, their risk, their investment style, their ratings, and their returns based on like or similar mutual funds in that sort of um, uh, universe. And their expenses, that's okay, average expense, it's certainly a lot more than ETF, but their returns are good. Their one-year return so far, year to date, at least when I made this PDF, was 8%. Their one-year return the last year has been a incredibly phenomenal, 94%. But their average annual return since 1987, which is what, 33 years, is 13% per year for a 33-year track record. Not bad. Um, and if you want to take a snapshot of this, I've got um, an investment of $5,200 a year tracked over very small increments of uh, interest. And you'll see the power of, again, being careful and being smart with your money. After 45 years, uh, a difference of 2%, a difference between 7 and 9% is a difference of about well, $1.6 million dollars over a 45-year period, I'd say that's pretty substantial. And 45 times 5,200 is a much smaller value. That's the amount of money out of your own pocket. That's a much smaller value than each of these numbers. Um, so there you go. Google is a powerful tool. There's some excellent textbook um, uh, books to read about personal finance. And I hope through this very long, I apologize, uh, drawn out story of a little bit of my history, financial history, um, I hope that you get some ideas and really get instilled the thought of starting to plan for your future now. And, you know, be balanced with your life. Have some fun. You don't, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed. But find a good balance for you for an amount that you could put to work and let that money do the work for you, okay? Um, that's it. Uh, that's all I got to say. If you made it to the end, thank you so much. I'm Mr. True. Bam! Go invest that money.